now I should be able to share, be heard, and be on. Okay, so. I learned this from my um, father-in-law. If you are particularly uh, silly, then you are a mummy, the Egyptian time. But if you are really, really a stupid mummy, then you are a mummy that cannot even walk. And that's me uh, today, uh, I, a mummy who cannot walk. Um, so now that a mummy that cannot walk is out of the way uh, and we are sharing the screen and the audio, as I was telling people here, but not people online, we're trying to understand the digital revolution. Um, and this year, I've concentrated more on description of reality. Uh, that was ontology, uh, the ontology of the world. Um, and then we moved to uh, ontology of the self, uh, personal identity and so on. We're now looking at artificial uh, intelligence as part of this environment in which we find things and relations between things, the world, us as agents, and new forms of agency, namely artificial intelligence. We do all this not metaphysically, meaning we're not trying to describe the world as it is in itself without taking into consideration what sort of epistemological framework you need to understand first so that you know how you are modeling the system. But we do all this epistemologically. So the sort of ontology that we are uh, going through is an epistemological ontology is not a metaphysical ontology. All terminology that varies from philosopher to philosopher. So nothing hangs on the words. Everything depends on the concepts behind the words. The sort of um, epistemological ontology of artificial intelligence that we have been discussing for some time now is based on the assumption that AI is not a marriage, it's a divorce. So it's not a way of putting together engineering artifacts and some kind of intelligence, even that of a mouse. But in fact, as a matter of fact, a divorce between the ability to achieve some goals with success, problem solving, uh, performance of a task, and the need to be intelligent in doing so, which is zero. You don't have to be intelligent if you are this fun and play chess better than anyone else in this room. You do that incredibly successfully at zero intelligence. That is the revolution. Not the sci-fi revolution of creating some form of intelligence, which is not to be found anywhere at this stage. To understand how that divorce can be successful, we need to understand how the environment adapts or is adapted to the divorce. Because normally, if you divorce intelligence and agency, all you get is a disaster. How come that instead you get so much success? This part of the world is also becoming AI friendly or friendly towards digital technology at large. I'll give you some example. If you remember, maybe the two robots ironing or pressing with a box or the actual Android doing it. The Android is not the future. It's not because it cannot be done in principle, but because the money is not there, it's cumbersome, it's not useful. You need one to just iron the shirts and another one to drive the car and another and another and another. Not the kind of world in which we're going to live. So probably not the future. But then how do we shape this environment around AI as a divorce? I covered so far three points. Uh, point number one was, well, we did that by abandoning, so to speak. We're still developing it, but not banking on, not relying too much on symbolic AI the logic mathematical kind, and shifting towards the more sort of statistical, probabilistic kind, neural networks and so forth. That was point number one, from uh, mathematical logic to statistics. We covered some more points uh, across uh, that sort of uh, line. Um, I won't cover all of them, just did it uh, this morning, to get to point number four. Point number four, um, but very briefly, uh, basically the other two points were was this enveloping out what it takes. Uh, and then uh, we covered the shift. And that is where AI is successful from difficult to complex. Difficult skills, different kinds of resources, complex, competition resources, lots of uh, potential success, 
if you can translate one into the other. So any task, any problem that is difficult and remains difficult, AI is not a solution. If you can translate difficult into complex, then AI is your best friend. How do you do that? How does it happen? One primary way of moving from difficult to complex is by looking at this distinction, the distinction between different kind of rules that we have for anything that is a, a rule dominated or rule organized sort of activity. It could be a game, and normally we refer to games, but it could be since we are in the jurisprudence uh, department, it could be a law, uh, it could be simply driving uh, the car. So any activity that has some rules attached to it is affected by this distinction. Let me warn you about one potential misunderstanding. This distinction uh, is similar to, but not identical to a distinction that has been made popular by John Searle as well. It's not the same. And in fact, John and I don't agree on which of the two distinctions is better. I think that he is a bit confused. Of course, philosophers they disagree with each other. Uh, and I think that this distinction captures much better what lies behind, which is the problem. Imagine some activity. You're doing something. It could be cleaning the dishes, playing football, uh, driving on the motorway, doing something. There are two separate ways in which that something can be regulated. The normal everyday experience is that you're doing something and the rules come afterwards. So the activity is there. For example, you start kicking a can with some friends in a field. And someone says, well, look, no, we need some rules. Uh, okay, there is where the field ends. If you pass that line, it's outside. Okay, rule number one. Or, well, it's going to be five people against another five people. Okay, that's rule number two, etc. And you can develop that into some kind of football. But the activity comes first. Football, tennis, driving, doing the dishes are all activities that get regulated by something that we can name as core regulative rules. These regulative rules, they constrain, they shape, they form, but they come after the doing. Something happens. You might be dancing, but it's a competition. So there are rules for the competition. So the dancing is not any dance, it's the dancing according to these constraining rules. So the order here, logically speaking, is activity constituting rules. Now, there are other activities that do not exist without the rules. Monopoly, chess. It's not that you play chess and then there are rules. Oh, no, 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 we need to play chess according to, there are rules that make up the game of chess. These are constitutive rules. The rules that make up an activity without which that activity will not be what we call chess playing or monopoly or checkers or often, yeah, as you can tell, board games. Um, but this distinction is crucial in order to understand where AI can be a very successful and where mm, not so much or less. If, uh, I thought I had another slide, but let's stay here. If you have activity first and then rules, it means that that activity has to be grasped, monitored, understood, quote unquote, known. You need information about the activity in the first place. So when it comes, for example, to robots which play football, no one in his remote so intelligent etc. thinks that they're going to go anywhere, even myself, who no, is not a football player. However, chess, checkers, go monopoly, even poker, which doesn't exist without. So any, any game where the rules are constituted, can be dominated by AI 
much, much more easily. Why? Because it is the rules that are constituted that generate the gain, and I can start playing against myself. So um, a whole branch of AI where this competition um, happens between an AI system and another AI system is such that the training happens inside the AI. The AI in question doesn't have to have information from the world to play, for example, chess. So good old days when uh, uh, IBM uh, Deep Blue uh, won against Castle uh, and uh, etc. The and I think some people still have that in mind. The success was due to the fact that there was a massive amount of uh, data that the system had as a database. So not only you were playing against a computer that could calculate and had albums, so, but you were playing against the best master of all time who had played that game and again and again and again. So for every move, there was the best move played by someone maybe in 1922. And then move was someone else who had uh, played in 1855, etc. So the database, meaning the historical database, was fundamental. AlphaGo, fast forward, did not have the last version, did not have any database. Learn to play chess by playing against itself. Winning for games, winning, 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 or losing, 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 until it learned what is the best way of playing chess. Now, at that point, the uh, two consequences at least. One is obvious, the other one is a bit more difficult. And I please forgive me for the one more difficult. If it doesn't become clear, don't worry, we pass on, it's not pushed. The consequence that is critical or quite obvious is that, as I will show you in number five, the five, the fifth point, you don't need to have access to real world, quote unquote, data to win that game because the game has constituted rules. All the legal moves are the moves allowed by that particular sort of uh, system rules. Therefore, you can play against yourself until you generate your own database and you become more and more, more proficient. In that field, AI will beat anybody sooner or later. In fact, if you understand that, you get bored by looking at one more alpha goal that wins one more uh, board game. In fact, you could invent today a board game whose rules are constitutive, and we know already that it will take no time for an alpha goal or any other sort of machine learning to learn, according to the rules, how to play a game better than anyone else. Is that what we invented yesterday? There is no historical database. Exactly. Now, is that clear? Because the other consequence is a little bit like as obvious. This is the obvious, obvious one. World in which the activities are made what they are by the rules. That world completely dominated by anything that can play against each, itself according to rules. Learn according to the interacting channel and the web. The other world, that is a bit more difficult. It's not impossible, but it's way more difficult. Let me give you a clear example. Medical diagnosis. When we, it's, a, it's an actually a concrete example. It dates back some years ago. Um, there was a project, uh, Microsoft Research Center at Cambridge. They had a wonderful project on, uh, very, very interesting, on uh, brain tumors. Uh, to, as a surgeon, to know the size, the shape, the measure, the position of their brain tumor at the time was an art. It was done by scanning the brain into, imagine, slices, 2D slices, one, two, three, a hundred, a million, whatever, and in 3D reconstruct from all the slices how that tumor was shaped. Now, they develop an AI system which does that fantastically well at some point better than any surgeon. However, it will always need historical data because the rules according to which a brain tumor develops are not constitutive, are regulative. And in fact, we don't even have them. In other words, when it comes to nature, 
the rules we have, imagine you know, uh, Newtonian physics. Well, they're kind of uh, almost okay. They work, they approximate, but it already not quite what like you are in the very, very small, in the very, very big. So the rules that we have are ways of capturing regularities in a pre-existent activity. If this is still not quite clear from some of the faces, that seems to be very obscure. Uh, imagine nature is the player you play against. You and nature are playing this game, but the rules of the game are, are not like chess, are like football. So you start playing with nature, and there are no rules. At some point, someone says, oh, look, whenever I do this, nature does that. Oh, that's a, a, regular, a, a regular activity, uh, something that normally, if I drop a pen, the pen falls. See what nature does? If I drop the pen, nature makes the pen fall, etc. But in this game, the rules that we extract, for example, the universal laws of physics, the rules of the game, come afterwards. Don't tell me that it's not there. Huh? Make the face like, yeah, that's obvious. So we'll go, go, because we learned that. Excellent. Yeah, as long as you like this, I'm going to stay in this world. So. Okay, so um, Bambi in front of the no, flashlight. <laughs> this is, this is, it is as stupid as it sounds. On the other hand, if you play against nature chess, you don't even need uh, nature to learn. You play chess with you, with yourself, a, a, a gazillion times. By the time you meet anyone, you play better than anyone because you have done all that according to constituents. There is no chess playing without a problem. So this is the consequence that is follows. The less obvious, especially for in, of interest for the chess players, right? but for the logicians in the room, so to speak. I, I, I'm not sure I can put it in, in, in ways that uh, are not obscure, so forgive me. Imagine that the space of your problem is literally a, 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 two, a, a circle no, that, that contains all the possible moves of that game. We're talking about a constitutive game like chess or Monopoly, okay? Or Go, something sufficiently complex. Monopoly doesn't really count. But. Now, how do we know how to win that game until yesterday, before AI? By having played millions of times chess among ourselves. At some point, there was an encyclopedia of chess that would record every uh, tournament, every serious uh, game, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, of this space, you explore one specific area, which is the area that is explorable by humans playing a game against each other. So what has emerged by having chess played by AI is that it starts exploring a completely different area. So when people who know how to play chess see AI playing chess at the highest level, it's like seeing people playing something never seen before because the whole space of problem has been explored. Imagine that this no, planet Earth, humans have been exploring, say, constantly America, and AI starts exploring Australia in terms of space of the problem, which is a winning uh, way of playing chess altogether. This is quite understandable if you think that uh, to play chess means to anticipate moves, if then, if then, da, 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 da. and there's a depth in the anticipation of the other move. If I do A, you do B. If you do B, then I do C. In this interplay, you go deeply, more and more deeply, until, for example, you have predicted six, seven moves. Or AI can go way more deeply. So what seems to be successful at move, shall we say, 10, might see, I actually turn out to be unsuccessful or less successful at move 15. So that space, which has been explored again and again and again by humans, is not necessarily the space that should be used, explored, etc. Logically speaking, if you have way more power at your disposal. As I said, this is a consequence that's a little bit obscure, 
I try to put it in you know, simple terms. If it is not clear, don't worry, because it does, nothing depends on what I'm going to say next on this particular consequence. It, ha it does have an interesting point about the fact that as, if you look at the future of some games, we might enjoy seeing artificial intelligence playing chess in a way that has nothing to do with our abilities to play chess that way. It's a bit like me seeing someone playing Mozart. I have no idea how to do it. I'm just astonished how beautiful it is. No, you enjoy the beauty of the logical processing. But back to us. I introduced this, uh, uh, by the way, because that's point number five. The other um, thing that will make AI probably successful in the future is how far you can put that dial from historical data to synthetic data. This comes uh, straight from the previous uh, point. Uh, here we can talk about generative adversarial networks, GANs. These are what I told you before, um, neural networks that work against each other. Um, typical case is in uh, um, uh, cybersecurity, when you have that sort of mechanism to test the security of a website. So, Why the tendency towards synthetic data and what synthetic data are in this course? Synthetic data mean a lot of things. Unfortunately, they, the terminology was um, created at a time when uh, synthetic data were linked to privacy and they were the follow or something like the follow. Personal data, they have been uh, anonymized and reduced to something that you could not. Um, run any risk of breaching privacy by using them. So they were made less real, less historical. Instead of talking about, say, everybody here, so just telling that in this room there are X number of people. Well, at that point, you don't know how many, you know, what age, gender, et cetera, et cetera. The way I prefer to use synthetic data, but it's an agreement in terms of terminology. If you don't like it, use something else. Call them data X. Now, is in terms of entirely generated by AI. So this is in comparison to historical data that come from, as you guess, you know, the source out there. In medicine, we have a lot of historical data. In fact, if you want to train, you still get people, again, it was eye-opening what you heard in the discussion between the on uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI these days in Italy, you still hear people saying, oh, um, these mechanisms, they are uh, like, um, they uh, absorb gazillions of data, that the whole thing works because you have immense, you no, know, big data. Uh, first of all, a note for the uh, scholars, um, Big data meant something very specific. It used to be. Now, this everybody in example speaks about big data meaning just large data set. But big data, technically speaking, is uh, normally uh, data coming from social media unstructured in large quantities and normally huge, hugely useless. It takes a lot to transform the big data into something that you can really work with. Now, as Amy here can testify back to, uh, at Oxford. All our colleagues working on big data of that time, social media setup, they spend an enormous amount of time downloading and refining, cleaning, scrapping, reorienting, uh, re you name it, to extract something that is useful. Unfortunately, now it is just a lot of data. Now, imagine you have a lot of data. And so adopt the terminology that is not appropriate, big data. The, stuff, the kind of data that you can, uh, say, get or used to be able to get from Twitter. Uh, or from Facebook. That is entirely historic. It's been generated outside the game, so to speak. You find it like medical data, your medical records. But these days, AI that wants to be trained, not like ChatGPT, but AI for a particular purpose, for example, um, uh, ophthalm ophthalmology, eye, etc., or cardiology, is not trained on big data large data sets, dirty, not updated, potentially inconsistent. They look for the best target of a database. For example, you want to work with that hospital that has clean data, 
undated, correct, not inconsistent, properly treated, that is the kind of database they want to use. That's why, for example, in the medical sector, uh, all the AI companies are after the highly curated databases, not the big data, not the not anything and his uncle. So with that clear in our mind, why historical data are not the real solution? Well, because first of all, for example, you need to an agreement with a hospital and say, can I please use your all the data you have in your cardiology sort of uh, database? Second, a lot of privacy. These are real data, real human being, real dangers of making a mess of the whole business. How much better if I could use synthetic data, data created, managed, clean, produced only by AI for AI. So here the distinction becomes obvious. If you are in the regulative area where the game happens and then you put the rules on it, to learn how to play their game will probably require historical data. The game happens. When we wanted to understand the spread of COVID, you could run all the simulations you want, but you need the historical data in order to validate at the end of the day whether that is what actually happened or not. You could, for example, simulate everything pretending that it starts in, uh, in Italy rather than in China. Well, how do you know, unless you know historically that it started there and it was traded? And the opposite, and the hybrid data, I'll tell you in a moment what they are, is the entirely synthetic data generated by AI for AI interacting with AI. Of course, all games are the example where this happens because constitutionally. I have the rules, I dominate the rules. I generate all the database that I need to learn how mm -hmm. to play games. I never have to check anything in the real world. I'm an AI no, sort of no, 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 I think someone uh, on the audio. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm an AI uh, software uh, system. I don't have to check what the world is like. I stay within my own sort of activities. I generate all the synthetic data. I become the best chess player uh, in the world. So the tendency is to try to move uh, his attention from historical to synthetic. You do that by trying to see whether you can rely on constitutive rather than regular ideas, translating the difficult into complex, you get the gist. Of course, by enveloping, you do your best to make sure that your game is exactly what you control 100%. So imagine a world in which uh, we transform the whole city into a driverless car friendly environment. We do the, exactly the opposite. We don't put the driverless cars in Bologna. We transform Bologna to fit whatever driverless cars we have. At that point, as you can tell, we're moving in the opposite direction. It's not traffic first and how I adapt, but rather some rules, et cetera. But there is no traffic until I decide how to design the system. This could be a little bit of a sci-fi example, but imagine you're building a new airport. In a new airport, you build the airport so that it fits the driver's buses that need to work in the airport. The lines, the sensors, the whatever traffic system you have, the control, is all designed around the AI. At that point, we also have some help from historical versus synthetic data. Now, the hybrid there, and that's why I put the dance on top there, is when you have two systems, one with historic and the other one is synthetic. So imagine I'm a website and uh, I'm being defended by AI. So imagine I'm, no, I'm the website I'm defending against your attack. I have historical data because I want to make sure that my uh, system of defense is what it is and works properly. You, on the other hand, are playing an attack game with your data. You build your database on the basis of or playing against a historical database. So your synthetic data are generated by playing against the historical data. In this dialectic, that's what you have in terms of hybrid. The outcome, is it entirely synthetic? Not really, because you generated a database by playing against historical data. Is it entirely 
historical, not really, because you generated that, that sort of uh, database independently, as it were, from how the world behaves in itself. You didn't sort of uh, download it from some kind of database uh, out there on how the world works. So as we uh, look at the development of AI, we will see a push for synthetic data. Final comment, uh, a long, long time ago, um, before COVID, spoke to uh, a big social network uh, that has a huge platform with billions of people on it. Uh, and I suggested that they should move to synthetic data. As I look at it, you have enough computational power, enough profiles, uh, enough interest in not breaching anyone's privacy to build your own sim, your own simulation. You should start working on this because at some point, you could have a population, say, of 10 million profiles on which you can run all the experiments you want. You don't have to A, B test, which is the testing that social platforms do on us to see what happens if I put yellow instead of green or something. You don't have to test things on your actual users. You could have a, a simulation and run the sort of experiments on the simulation so that no one gets upset. If it works and everybody's happy, you can implement it. You have some complaints, we'll see. Success zero, like, <laughs> not at all. One day, you see someone doing it, you know, you heard it before. Another company that should have done that and didn't, and it led to a complete disaster. Speaking of simulation, data, regular rules, et cetera. This is common knowledge and is classic textbook material. So if you haven't bumped into it, um, here we go. Amazon uh, in America, uh, that must launch this uh, same day uh, products delivered uh, in several cities, uh, the big ones. And um, I guess I'm staying in this slide for too long. <clears throat> and uh, instead of, so the system is clear, uh, you order something and uh, uh, if you are um, in that particular sort of uh, trial, etc., you get uh, the delivery on the single day. Unfortunately, the algorithm had some little glitch. It's unclear what the glitch is. So what I'm telling you is a fanciful reconstruction. It's just an example. It's not what happened. Imagine that we live in Boston, Los Angeles, New York, uh, Chicago, all the big cities. And there's a single day, sorry, uh, same day delivery. However, there's a, a logical, optimization procedure. If I deliver to him because he has spent $100, then I stay around there and I deliver to the next person in this problem. Even if the next person has spent $1, instead of going to her who has spent $80. You repeat this for several times and they generated an impeccable map of all major American cities between divided into the maps into white and black communities. Beautiful. The white community was served always first, the black community always late. No matter what someone in the say, black community has spent compared to someone in the white community. A total disaster. Bloomberg, investigative journals, uh, journalism, apologies, you can I, I, you can not find this online. They could have run this as a simulation easily. Easily. This is really a piece of cake. And you would have seen the emergent property of what I told you is a fanciful rule, just to give you a sense of what would have been a completely you know, uh, uh, unethical, unpleasant, bad for business, bad for uh, PR kind of uh, feature. Back to the data. If you have enough uh, data, you can actually start simulating. Is it going to be enough of uh, uh, historical data, highly curated, totally niche? For example, as I said, cardiology or that particular app or a specific kind of uh, rare disease and so on? Or, and, or is it going to be synthetic data? It depends on hybrid included. Well, it depends on the kind of rules you have, etc. But at this point, all these five forces should help to explain why this divorce is uh, a success. Speaking of data, uh, I 
wanted to show you this map. I think I showed it before. I'm not quite sure, um, but it's one of many uh, that you find online. Anyone has one or another of these curves. The most important thing to understand why the divorce is working and it's working now is to look at the bottom left. Uh, in any conference you go, everybody would point here, top right. Say, oh my goodness, there's so much that, so much that. Yeah, I know, but the real, real extraordinary point is bottom left, is when it all started, 2005. And suppose we are wrong by five years, 10 years. Make it 2000, make it 1990. It's yesterday. All the data we have have been generated by this generation, have been created by us all. Now, in this 163, 200, or whatever amount of zettabytes we had, consider the zero one zettabyte from the beginning of writing until then. And if we are wrong by you know, a decade, and we are wrong by, say, twice as much, Oh, it wasn't, sorry, I'm wrong. How do, it was zero two, zero, zero five zettabytes. You can tell that compared to 160 or 170, it's nothing. And that includes every library, every manuscript, every book ever printed, every black and white movie, every song ever you know, listened to, every word ever uttered by humanity, 0 0.5 zettabytes. That's the data we had. That's the data that we had when we were teaching not now networks in the 90s. No, it just, it wasn't there. Fast forward and you have hundreds. No wonder that we live inside this green area. That is the kind of online experience, the enveloping, everything happens because we are swimming in this ocean of data and it's growing and it will keep growing. There's no reason to think that this is ever in the foreseeable future going to stop in terms of creation of new data. What is the problem here, not for today, I think I anticipate this uh, during the Q&A, is um, in the past, is where do we put this data? <coughs> As uh, no, could, uh, said, uh, testified, uh, I didn't have my USB, etc. You have to put the stuff somewhere. You need to have the memory support. So it doesn't matter how much memory, uh, sorry, how much data you generate. The real problem is how much memory you have to put the data somewhere. And if you don't have enough data, you start deleting. So one of the things I think we discussed during the q and if I'm not wrong, um, is what kind of policies do we have to delete data as opposed to what kind of policies we have to save data? Is that clear? So millennia of human history are millennia that ha we have spent to learn the lesson of what to save, what to put on, uh, on marble, what to put on this ceiling, what to put on paper. It takes an effort to move from it's going to disappear to it's going to be somewhere. Recording something. Today, it's just the other way around. The recording comes by default. I mean, things just accumulate as any photograph in your phone accumulates every time you take one. At some point, they don't get in anymore. You start deleting, which follows to delete, which emails you have to uh, get rid of. Your no, two terabytes computer is too small now. Uh, when in fact, no, yesterday, no, two giga was like massive, etc. So for that, we need to uh, have a different kind of a, a story, but we have finished this, um, sorry, um, this little, go around the AI kind of story. Logical statistics, enveloping from difficult to, co co to uh, complex, from uh, uh, different kind of rules, you know, the, uh, the one that constraints and the ones that actually uh, constitute and the historical synthetic data. I think that around these five elements lies the future of AI as a divorce. If I'm right, well, I'll, I'll meet you in five years and see what happens. If I'm wrong, this has been such a big mistake. Uh, we're not going to go there. I don't think so. So at this point, uh, it becomes clear why, now I've said also at the beginning of this course, we live in this kind of space of infosphere, the enveloping, uh, as we said before, and 
this is a, a more sort of intuitive representation of what it means to live in the infosphere. I've used it more than once, so forgive me if you've seen it around. Um, this is a, an, an enveloped robot. The envelope is the box. This is how the world is not going to look like. No Android will do the dishes the way I do them at the basin. This is the past and the future. This is a potential future. It's another interface. You can tell a camera here, the whole kitchen becomes enveloped so that this arm can actually put the dishes inside the dishwasher. So at the moment, I'm the interface between the dirty dishes and the dishwasher. There's an envelope, which is my kitchen, and the interface between the kitchen and, and the dirty dishes and the other envelope and the robot, it's a human being. They take it and you put it inside, and then you put them back. Now, on this, I wouldn't mind to have a trial in my house, since I'm the one who actually on record puts the dishes uh, and uh, takes them out. By analogy, this is what has happened to us. So it's important to remember what computers look like. This is a, a I don't know, grandma, so to speak. No. Programming is a somatic body related activity with a screwdriver. You change a bulb and put another bulb. Uh, you plug and unplug things. Essentially, metaphorically, but not so much, you literally walk inside a computer. The computer is like you. So you enter into the room and around you is the computer. So we were inside the computer. The daughter got out of the computer. The computer became uh, a desktop, which is not a bit of a funny name. Uh, um, and it became something in front of us. But the granddaughter is inside the computer again. It just, she doesn't see it. So over here, the experience is almost like being here. The computer is around you. Uh, it's made of, of course, in this case, uh, G5, you hope, and things like that. You notice that the envelope is not working and it's not there when you have problems. The default position is just a sort of seamless experience that doesn't have a glitch. This is the real future, and it's one of the things, um, like how do you make a computer you know, for an AI that collects strawberries, like this? You adapt the strawberries to the, to the machine. Well, this is not science fiction, this is something that you buy an internet. Imagine collecting those uh, strawberries by hand. Well, they could be anywhere. But if they had to be collected by that robot, you have to have that kind of structure. And of course, this is no longer for humans. This is for the machines. It's like a um, barcode. A, a barcode at a supermarket is not for our eyes. It's for the recognition of the machine. There's more. Um, so the next one uh, is another good example. I'll show you the just a picture um, of a warehouse. This is Ocado, uh, and um, it's one of the successful um, supermarkets in, in the UK. Um, not sure it's in Italy. The most successful um, business of Ocado is actually exporting the warehousing technology. Uh, it's, it's a no, uh, grocery, uh, started as a grocery sort of, uh, enterprise. Now, if you look at this, these are all tiny robots, more kind of, uh, the size of, uh, of a medium-sized dishwasher. Um, and they collect things from below, not from the shelves. This space is entirely designed so that they work. Of course, you can't even walk here, but no, it's not made for us, it's not made for human beings. But these days, uh, Ocado sells you the whole thing, the warehouse, the technology, the robots, the traffic control, they all go and recharge automatically. Obviously, again, no science fiction. It's, if you order anything from Ocado in the UK, that's how no, this is just it's rather common. So whenever uh, we order anything from them, 
a robot has to pick it up, put it there, and humans take care of it. I think it's a good example to give a sense of both the advantages and the disadvantages of enveloping the world around the machine rather than the other way around. Because this is fantastic, but as I said, it's not for us. And if you start doing this to say our urban environment to make sure the driver's cars work, well, you miss the whole point, which was of course the environment was for us, not for the machine. That's how it looks now from above and how they fish these things from the bottom. Um, I think that's a bit too much for advertisements, so we can move on. Uh, can pause for a moment. We spent some time showing what AI is not and it's not going to be. Um, then a little bit of time to discuss what AI is and what could be. Uh, also, what so. Uh, Trajectories today seem to be leading to uh, some success in the future. All this generates, as we know, an enormous amount of uh, obviously solutions, but also challenges. To me, the best way of understanding all the problems we have ethical, uh, legal, socio political is to understand them as being created by the divorce, metaphorically speaking. You got a divorce between agency and intelligence, and it's in that gap that you find a lot of problems. Problems of misuse, overuse, underuse, as I tell you in a moment, but also, for example, of uh, uh, misuse by some people to breach privacy or to misuse them when, in fact, they are totally biased, etc. So it's like saying, look, this stuff is devoid of intelligence. If you were intelligent, you could teach it. But it isn't. It's not trainable like a dog. So you know, don't pull there. Pull in the other place. Don't bark now. Be careful. So don't bite the little kid. And I'm off. It's not nice, etc. It's not trainable. It's not trainable in that sense, everything speaking. You can teach it to you know, collect a glass of no, a bottle of water and put it in the basket. So that's not good enough. So the gap between agency and intelligence puts an enormous pressure on the only intelligent agent in the room, which is the humans. Obviously, I mean, it goes without saying. And yet, you keep hearing AI has done this, AI is a problem, AI is going to destroy the world, it's going to save the world, AI is not going to do anything unless the humans behind will do something or not something. So every time you hear one more letter signed by some other notable part, which uh, people in the state saying AI is an existential risk. Not you are the existential risk if you think so. It isn't. But should you be an existential risk, you would be the existential risk behind. If you keep building something that you truly believe could be an existential risk, you should stop immediately. Of course, it isn't, so that's another different problem. But in terms of coherence, so that's what we're going to see in the next uh, hour or so. What are the principles, the challenges, and and anyway, what do we do about it? How do we audit AI? So this is something that you have seen already probably a million times, uh, one way or another. This is just a summary. I'm going to be much weaker now because I expect more familiarity, what I'm going to say. I like to divide the, all the general problems into three blocks rather than two. It's not just good and bad, but it's also a good, the green, the bad, the red, but also the missed opportunities. The uh, amber. The amber here is when AI is under use, and there's plenty of under use of a fantastic technology. The medical area is um, a whole field that could do so much more and so much better by using AI. We're not there. There are reasons: cost, but also lack of regulations. And if you have a deficit of regulations or even ethical standards and principles, no one dares to go there because if something goes wrong, the responsibility is all yours. And there is no sense of what is right and wrong 
completely, entirely. So you go to one of those uh, international shows where they uh, present uh, some technology for medical appliances and so on. And honestly, I've done that a few times. It looks like you're looking into a sci-fi movie. The kind of things that can be done are astounding. And then you're told that that is all on the shelf, but it's not being used anymore. Not from, uh, in terms of cure, not in terms of prevention, uh, or just knowledge of what we could actually discover, etc. So there's a huge amount of more that we can do here. The green is quite obvious. Uh, if you look at the red, is the counterpart of the red. AI that could be overused when it's not necessary, or when it's the wrong kind of AI, um, and mistakes happen. Another example, again, textbook material, uh, Amazon again, uh, tried to develop for, uh, I think, three years, and then they gave up, as far as I know. And uh, so, uh, automatic AI-based system to go through the uh, um, uh, employment recruiting uh, sort of process. You may imagine uh, Amazon has gets millions of people. The turnover is massive. I mean, you're talking about thousands of people coming in, going, coming in. The advantage of making even a couple of steps automatic there are huge. The trouble was that the AI system, the only thing they could do, remember, their mirror could be trained on the past data. Training on the past data turned out that the, the past data that shows that inadvertently, shall we say, Amazon had been hugely skewed. The bias in the uh, sort of hiring was significant. Try to fix it, improve it, ameliorate it, but, but in the end, it didn't quite work. So as far as I know, that program has been in the model. So not yet active in any way. So if you look at this, uh, it could be overused. Uh, imagine that you decide, I don't care, I'm going to use it anyway. Uh, it solves my problem. Yeah, but it's full of mistakes, bias, um, going to hire the wrong people. Or it could be uh, misuse, not just use too much when we don't, we have to actually used for the wrong reasons. Now, in the misuse, to be gentle, um, there is a whole universe, as we speak, of course, of organized crime. The amount of AI that's been uh, used by organized crime is increasing on a daily basis. Think, for example, in terms of uh, uh, digital uh, identity and how you steal digital identity. Of course, not phishing, the, uh, attempts to make sure that you need to click on that or you the data, it's all become more automatic. It's been AI uh, or AI supported, so misused. All this leads to devaluing human skills um, in context where no, we shouldn't. We remove human responsibility, reduce human control, or erode human self-determination. And I'm, not, I'm talking about ethical issues, I'm not talking about the illegal stuff. Like and of course, what AI could instead would be enabling human self-realization, enhancing human agency, increasing social capabilities, cultivating social cohesion. So it could really be a force for good in general, including the environment, as I hope we'll be able to see. To cope with this green, blue, amber, we have had a season of ethical principles. At some point, you couldn't turn a page a day uh, a week that someone somewhere was you now putting forward the AI principles. Um, we started in the UK, uh, with or no, so Canada, uh, in, uh, internationally. These are just a list of the most uh, um, influential, most visible. The ones that also include more participants, for example, the IEEE. Um, at some point in Europe, we started this initiative um, and was um, I chair this initiative, the AI for People, which push uh, the uh, European Commission to uh, establish the high level group for the ethics uh, of uh, AI, um, uh, the high level ethics group for AI, which then led to the AI Act. The AI Act and the work of the group was basically photocopied by the OECD. At some point, um, I'm just going to be careful on this, but um, recording. Uh, there was a debate within the uh, UK government uh, in terms of what kind of AI principles should be adopted. Now, this debate was post Brexit, and of course, the, <laughs> the principles were right there. We had elaborated in Brussels, it was obvious. 
but it was a no-fly zone, politically speaking. The UK government could not adopt, of course, the AI principles just spoke by uh, Europe. And so we had this panel, we had the government, uh, the Senate for uh, uh, Data Ethics and, and Innovation, and push and pull, and at the end, uh, <laughs> There's always a way around, and so I suggested, um, to be embarrassing, but I, I, I better go ahead. Um, so I suggested to use the uh, OECD principles. UK is one of the members, it's international, it's not uh, European. Anyway, said, okay, well, we can do that. But the only, if you look at the OECD symbols, it's just a photocopy of the European ones. <laughs> but the facade, the face was safe. Uh, the UK government had not, not considered not to Europe. Uh, and had just signed with the OECD uh, instead. Now, of course, we also had in the Beijing AI principles. Uh, note the absence here of one of the principles, a little more in a moment, autonomy. Um, at some point, the Vatican uh, woke up uh, much, much later again uh, for the AI room call for ethical principle of AI. Way too late. I mean, significantly late. Um, I, Remark that uh, to the people in charge. Uh, they say, well, we need a hand. Um, okay, so we got this text again, all these on radio. Luckily, but to get it. So, um, and the whole text, uh, which is perfectly reasonable, I'm the uh, principal uh, uh, 10, 10 cents, 10 dimes a kilo, uh, right, is all in terms of men. Men can do this, men can do that. Too many in the, in the UK not to see that immediately as something problematic. It's not men that there's a, it's humanity. No, there's more than just men around the world. So one of the contributions <laughs> is to translate the whole text into something that is a little bit more so inclusive. Fine. Please go online if you are, if you're not, and check what happened to that text. If you see the whole text, it's humanity. I hope they've been changed. That's me. Listen, word processing today. You see, the introduction is man again, <laughs> because I didn't check the website. So, in the website, presenting the principles, if things haven't changed, man is done doing this, and man responsibility, and man, and man, and man. But finally, if you find the principles, humanity appears. So, everybody is on board. That's for an ethical kind of, uh, code of practice. Anyway, the AI uh, call uh, for uh, AI ethics was signed also by uh, UNICEF, and Microsoft, and some other uh, agents. Uh, now it's being advertised as something that all universities should subscribe. It doesn't make any difference. Subscribe, not subscribe, it's, it's, it's useless. The reason why it's useless is because of this um, at the bottom, the EUA Act. The ethical principles were crucial. If you remember the first lecture, why do why to do ethics when the law is there? But it's crucial when you don't have legislation and you need to shape the legislation. You need ethical principles to understand how do we go about creating this new piece of legislation. Once the legislation is there, going around trying to cook one way or another your set of principles is a rather pointless exercise. Unless what you're telling me is that those principles will do the rest of the work of the ethical analysis. Remember, when the law is unclear, when the law is not covering, when the law needs to be interpreted. Unclear, so not there, needs to be interpreted. Well, maybe you need some ethical principle. But then you have all this, the OCD, the Europeans, by presenting one more set. I'm not quite sure, but everybody of course, needs to have my precious. Uh, and uh, my precious here is my set of principles, different from many others. The truth is that, thanks to uh, the collaboration with a very brilliant uh, former colleague of ours, now uh, Dr. Uh, Josh Kals, uh recently uh, finished his PhD, his PhD. Josh and I, uh, back in October, did a comparative analysis of this and others' uh, sets of principles. Turn out that they all mean these five things, different words, different wording, different kind of uh, nuances, but they're all about the beneficence, the normal efficiency, autonomy, the justice, and the explicability of AI. There's more to be said about this, but I'd like to call you, your attention to two points. 
The beneficence or non-maleficence is easily understandable. Autonomy, as you can tell, sometimes is missing. The IEEE missed that. The importance of respect, for example, for human autonomy, what it means to be uh, careful about human rights, what it means to be attentive to human dignity, under here, is also missing from the partnership, and it was missing from the Beijing AI principles. Here, probably, we just guess, because we have no uh, nasty for political reasons. The explicability is present everywhere, and is the novelty compared to this four principle. This four are the standard four principles in bioethics. Not an accident. Bioethics, not a kind of agency, but agency nonetheless. So the intuition, or if you like the suggestion, the hypothesis behind this analysis was, when I spoke to Josh, I said, I bet that if we do the analysis of all these principles, coming from an agency perspective, not intelligence, but agency oriented, we're gonna get exactly the same mapping that we have in the agency, question is human or uh, biological, and, and bingo, there it was. The novelty was the explicability, because you remember the traffic example, what happens if you build a system that is complex enough, such that it has so many elements interacting with so many other elements, that you cannot predict what every element will do at that time in that place. Well, now imagine, like the traffic in Bologna, eight o'clock in the morning, Schools are open, et cetera, et cetera. But you need a different kind of explanation. You cannot look for what every single atom in that mechanism system is doing. You need to do averages, statistical, higher level of uh, abstraction, et cetera. So the explicability becomes a principle, ethical, in order to understand two things. One, why it does what it does. So uh, with another colleague of ours, uh, David Watson, uh, we wrote a paper, a published paper on how doctors, having been uh, exposed, trained, blah, 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 to AI systems, can actually not only understand what's going on, but explain it to the patient. You go to see the doctor, and the doctor needs to be able to give you an explanation of why this is the case. But there's also something else for the engineer. The explicability here is in terms of, do I really know why? is doing what it's doing and therefore fix it or change it if I want to improve it, for example, or do I just have to take it at face value? So the explicability is, has become one of the major issues in the ethics of AI, quite rightly, both towards, if you like, the user and towards the designer. There's the designer needs explicability to change, improve, modify, fix. The user needs it in order to know what What's going on and why should I take that tablet rather than another? Oh, the computer says so, it's not good enough. In all this interplay, all these principles um, have put with a series of challenges. You know that Big Bad Robot is not the challenge. The challenges are led or created by the gap between, in the case of AI, between agency and intelligence. But we come from uh, a long history by now, decades long, of ethical challenges. They are related to, in one case, remember the previous uh, lecture on personal identity, who I am, who I be, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you have a, a lot of data around, what is being challenged is your private identity. In a way, I can even guess what you're going to have tomorrow for dinner or I can uh, know exactly what to present as, you know, in terms of shopping for your, say, kids in a family, etc. I can manipulate your political choices if I have enough data and so on. So the data revolution in the digital revolution challenges my private identity. The AI revolution within the digital revolution challenges my intelligent autonomy. I'm being pushed and pulled, nudge, manipulated. If you like this, you may like that. But also, um, I'm increasingly treated as an interface, as a means to an end. Uh, the end might be access to my bank account or uh, my credit uh, or access to my data. All this leads to a challenge in terms of end of human exceptions. 
if I'm challenged in terms of my private identity, imagine oversimplifying. If the computer knows better than I, than I do who I am and what I want, it can guess even before I guess that tomorrow I might like no, a cook for, uh, say, lunch. And if AI is challenging my intelligent autonomy by undermining it or manipulating it and so on, what happens to my special role in the universe? Remember the four revolutions, you know, at the center of this, at the center of that, etc. Et so all this, we're not going to go down that road, um, leads to uh, our better understanding, terrible phrase, sorry, of what AI can, or can do and should not do and do for us, but should not do in this challenge. So <clears throat> we're, gonna, we're going to see five blocks, uh, and a lot of the challenges can see under these uh, five blocks. First of all, we should make AI work we should make AI. Not AI should work, we should make AI. Design AI, deploy AI, etc. use AI, work against what I'm doing. Here, one of the many, but perhaps the most significant, certainly the one that we speak more regularly about, in terms of challenge, is vulnerability, bias being the counterpart. Human agents are highly vulnerable. They, we are easily uh, manipulated, influenced, uh, exploited. And the challenge in make AI working against what I'm doing here is to protect this vulnerability. The view being that you don't discharge on users all the responsibilities for the proper use of AI. You make sure that AI is designed so that users, say us, the end uh, game, so to speak, are not exposed to that sort of uh, risks. Make AI enhance human decision control. Here, more uh, in the next lecture, uh, the task is to handle, for example, among many, the challenge of complexity. The number here, um, not very controversial, even after COVID, um, is they show where humanity is going to leave by 2050, which hopefully we will all see uh, it's a good chance. Um, about 70% of humanity, uh, roughly 6.4, 6.5, numbers are growing. Um, in fact, these numbers are, are, are old, uh, of, news of humanity will live in immense cities. This cities generate a huge amount of data and problems. Using the data and AI to manage all that complexity seems to be like a no-brainer. And that is, the, is a positive future of this sort of uh, make AI our friend. I'm going a bit quick because I want to reach the work uh, 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 issue uh, jobs. Support human responsibility. No, I remember in the list of the green good things, uh, not undermine it. Now, in this case, of course, the other side is not just societal uh, fairness, but care, care for the world. I mean, AI can be an amazing solution for global uh, uh, work and climate change. We've got plenty of examples. We did a, a project for three years, um, managed to get together, which was not easy. And, can, and you can imagine uh, Google, Facebook, uh, and Microsoft in a single project. They sponsored this project back in Oxford to look at what AI can do to support the, S, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals at 17, and we are not even remotely close to not, uh, reach them. A lot. Uh, one of the uh, deliverables of that project was a database. We connected something like 120, 130 projects, actual AI projects based somewhere in the world using real AI to solve, support, or enhance one of the sustainable goals. At the end of the project, we merge that with another database based in, which is based in Hong Kong, um, again on AI and SDGs. I think we have roughly now 200, 250 projects. So it's just getting into a significant uh, amount. All these projects are non-commercial, um, uh, so they are supported either by NGOs or uh, governments, etc. But it's clear evidence of what you could do to use AI to support the decent approach to the environment. It can be done. We're not doing it. 
even that that basis of a little problem in an ocean of, in fact, missile opportunities, misuse, underuse, overuse of AI, but not right use. Partly, uh, I remind here uh, students who need to choose a project. Partly, is also the feasibility trial. It's, a, it's not very easy to put it nicely, uh, so I'll do my best. But often, when uh, especially one is at the beginning of research, um, is exposed to these technologies, the feasibility trap is nothing else, my own personal terminology, to describe a very obvious phenomenon. It can be done, therefore, we're going to do it. Look, we can count with AI how many penguins are on their island. Fantastic. Let's count the penguins. Is that useful? Do we need to know how many penguins? What's the next stage? Or is it just because you could do it? We have our colleague, once again, in our research group back in Oxford, uh, Jorge, who is uh, um, using AI, satellite data, and many other sort of uh, open access uh, IT digital related resources to help the government to identify mass graves in Mexico. Now, that is not a feasibility trap. That is an amazing project. Use all this technology, all this computational power, all the data to help find mass graves. Never I speak to Yogi, Yogi, I know I'm recording this, you know what I'm talking about. I need to have a moment afterwards because the topic is certainly not cheerful. And yet, you can see that that is the real use for society in favor of something that is worth pursuing. The visibility trap is that we can map it. Let's do it. Remember already a um, similar student who wants to map all the parts in London where the gay community would go on Saturday. Ask the question, why? Because we can. Okay, but apart from the danger, those were part of years, you know, we may not want to have that kind of information out there because uh, people are nasty. But also, what's the point? What's the research behind? How are you going to use this? What's the value added? Zero. Feasibility trap. Normally, it's a method, it's a technology, it's AI. I can be there for It's going to be cool to do. When, in fact, there's so much more that should be done and done properly. It should make us more human, and that's the autonomy that you normally don't find in the headlines. The constant erosion of human uh, autonomy is a real risk. You can imagine now this, this, this is an old slide. That, that robot is no longer produced. It was in use in a hospital, and it's just a, a cute picture of something like real. But the point is, all the non-robotic real AI that we find on a iPhone, smartphone, on, on Netflix, on uh, Amazon, gently, constantly suggesting, reminding, pushing, pulling, nudging. But that is a lot of autonomy that goes out of the window. But also, for example, you start delegating the decisions. Now, should we or should we not expand Bologna Airport? It's a big debate. Been long for a long time. And by the way, on range, yes, please. The direct, direct flight from New York. Thank you. Uh, but should we actually have a direct flight to New York, which is highly recommended? Um, what else no, do we do here? Is that a political decision? Are we su being supported by AI? Or do we delegate, say, I don't know, let's, let's ask Chat GPT? Now, you find a lot of that already. Uh, and I think that. This is a subtle, very long-term erosion that we should really be careful about, especially as people are born exposed to these technologies. They don't even know, for obvious historical reasons, what the world was like before these technologies were around. This uh, is actually old. I didn't find uh, something newer. If you do, please share it. But it's the expenditure worldwide on so-called programmatic advertising. Now, the programmatic advertising is what lies behind, literally, what you see on a um, search, search engine, for example, when you do a search and pops up, um, imagine, accidentally, hire a bike in Bologna. 
how does Google know about that? Because uh, the learning volume is there. But the, there is a competition behind the company that is advertising the hiring of a bicycle in Bologna and another that hires, for example, a light clothes for the summer in Bologna. One of the two will show the advertisement, the other will lose. That fight happens in a fraction of a fraction of a second. It, it's almost immediate and it's called programmatic advertising. The cost in 2017 was $33 billion. So we were spending $33 billion on deciding who wins the competition for my eyes to see advertisement A as opposed to advertisement B. That is the power behind the illusion of my autonomy. So for some people should not get their life close as opposed to get a bike or whatever else. This world is, is what it is. I, I'm being particularly critical about it, but we should be a little bit more aware, educate ourselves and distance ourselves a little bit more from this enormous pressure. And as you can tell, the line is going up and up and up and up. So what we spend to make sure that we can influence other humans to do what we would like them to do, meaning buy this instead of that, this is what we're pushing constantly. And we will be using AI more and more to do exactly this. So the disappointment is when the journalist interviews like, what do you think AI has great opportunities for society and the environment? Absolutely. So you're happy about it, not at all, because we are wasting those opportunities. We're using AI to sell more gadgets online, to get the next movie on Netflix, to make sure that it's changing rules better, which is okay, but while society is sinking and the environment is being destroyed, maybe our opportunities and priorities should be rebalanced. This is the one on which I'm going to spend more time of the whole points work for humanity, because of course, a lot of things have been uh, said on AI is going to steal my jobs. Again, I didn't find more recent data, uh, but uh, this one's I hope they are sufficient. Um, AI will generate at least these two phenomena. They already, it already has. All automation does that, but AI multiplies both polarization and do it yourself, DIY. The polarization is obvious. There will be people who you know, will have more time, better jobs, uh, more money, et cetera, et cetera, and those who will be pushed at the opposite side. There's money, there's opportunities, there's uh, so, uh, uh, earning, and et cetera. More on this in a moment. The DIY is a bit less clear. I don't see it uh, stressed enough in uh, uh, the literature or even uh, uh, on, on the dailies, um, but it's obvious. A lot of the um, push of automation is not to replace the human, but shift who does what. So the classic example is the supermarket. If it hasn't happened here, it will. Now the UK in terms of supermarkets is one of the most advanced countries in the world for once, and it's a good uh, place where to be. Immense competition, both uh, costs, etc. They leave their home, blah, blah, blah. And of course, the costs have to be cut everybody, meaning automation, meaning a lot of uh, IT for one kind or another, meaning shift that I had to do this instead of someone helping me. I had to scan the beans at the supermarket. There is no machine that scans the beans for me. They just shifted the burden of who scans the bean from someone who job to which other who's buying it. The example uh, will probably be more uh, sort of obvious to talents as shift, things shift in this country in terms of who um, helps you at the petrol pump. The dead person costs a lot of money. If I could have the same price for petrol, but you do it instead of me paying someone to do it for you, that's a lot of money that I'm going to save. Now, because of cultural reasons, here there are still people who actually help you to get gas, American style, cashew. In the UK, none. It just doesn't exist. There's nobody who's going to help you. If you don't know how to do it, you're stuck. You have to have, you have to ask someone else to, who, to drive the car. But there's no one. You can wait the rest of your life there, waiting, saying, anyone at the pump? I'm, I'm a customer. 
Nope, you go, pick it up, stick it in. Put enough back, get it card, all done, app, boom, 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 and it's sorted. So what has happened is that automation, now these are very simple examples, has shifted the job, hasn't made it automatic, it just managed enough to make sure that I do the DIY, do it yourself, as opposed to someone else, now the robot, the Android comes and does it for me. But that science fiction. If you start looking at this, you should be looking around in terms of how many things I'm doing that in the past were the job of someone doing it. And how does the you know, costing and IT, et cetera, et cetera, and shift the burden on my shoulders rather than someone else? This is the data that I told you um, are old uh, because they have 2022 as a projection. Um, they were collected, uh, they are collected regularly every X years by the American Tracking Association. Uh, there's a report you can find online, uh, but maybe the uh, one uh, sort of, uh, more recent is available. Um, when I prepared the slides, it wasn't, uh, but maybe I missed it. So if you find a new one, please let me know. This is the 2015 and it's already updated. Um, These are the number of people, the, the blue line, um, number of uh, uh, drivers available in the American market, American uh, US. These are the ones needed. There's a gap by 2022, so we're there, uh, of about 240,000. Why this data? Because until yesterday, if you read the report saying driver's cars are coming, they're going to destroy, completely annihilate the whole market about truck drivers. Who needs a truck driver when you have a driver's car, a driver's truck? Now, this is the reality. That is rhetoric. The rhetoric is based on a misconception. The misconception is that job equal task. But a job is many tasks. One of the jobs of a truck driver, of course, is to drive from A to B. The other task in their job is to open the gate. Oops. Okay, we make the gate automatic. Check that the eggs no, are not broken because there was a boom, boom, boom. That uh, okay, we make we put a sensor inside to check that the end. You can see how things start getting into how the heck do I envelope the whole thing so that I can have a driver's truck actually doing the whole job, all the tasks. It feels a form, you know, electronic form, automatically scanned. At some point, you know what? I'll get get a truck right. And they are missing 240,000. Or oh, a truck driver uh, earns, I think, again, double check, to take my word, about the same uh, as an associate professor. So, not so bad, 60,000 to go even higher, depending on how good you are. So, it's not a bad job. Uh, so, it's not that the shortage is also caused by uh, we don't have uh, uh, enough incentives. This gap here shows you how the rhetoric of jobs are being destroyed by. Um, uh, AI has gone. And this is the paper that has started the whole rhetoric. It's actually from two colleagues of ours. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, a few months ago, uh, Dr. Frey became a colleague of ours at the Oxford Exchange, um, just been appointed as Associate Professor uh, at the AI. Frey and Osborne, Osborne actually is a colleague of mine in college, so I'm very close to both of them, and I'm sorry to criticize them in public on record, published this paper. Uh, the paper was a, uh, sorry, this one uh, on the right hand side, was an analysis of the distribution of occupational employment over the probability of computerization at points of interval, saying which jobs are going to be totally safe, which are going to be totally destroyed, polarized. On one side, and these are a number of millions of workers, these are thousands, this is Finland. This uh, map, this sort of U um, shape, show that the politician would have been or should have been immense, meaning that normally those are the two examples standard car or taxi driver, goodbye, drive the skies. The job doesn't exist. One day, both. On the opposite, I don't know why, but it's also always a personal trainer. I mean, I don't know how many people have a personal trainer, but apparently, if you have a personal trainer, their job is safe because he comes to your house and puts hands on you. Now, we don't want to have the robot to be handled. 
So personal trainer and cab drivers, classic examples. Anything in between. Model shape, color and tissue. If you read that paper, there's a beautiful uh, premise, which I remind anyone, of course, people don't read. And the premise of the paper was that we assume, and especially in this place, we assume that in order to predict the job market of the future, legislation and regulation will make no difference. I repeat this. We're going to assume, in order to predict the shape of the future market of the United States, that legislation following years will make no difference. Because if you start including legislation, then it becomes unpredictable. Imagine the following scenario. Someone somewhere says, cab drivers can only be driven by humans. End of the story. Or imagine someone says, you need to have two pilots for every airplane. No one to, as is a matter of fact. Those two jobs are forever, etc. Now, imagine someone says, I'm going to do some weather forecast. Okay. But I'm going to assume that winds make no difference. Why? Obviously, the weather is impossible. Well, exactly. But winds do make a difference. So this is a completely pointless exercise. It's a speculation. It has nothing scientific in it because you assume that something that it does make a difference, we know makes a difference, is not going to be included. Why? Because otherwise you couldn't do it. I find that baffling, astonishing. So many, many years later, uh, I'm doing some work for uh, the Ministry of Transport in Finland, of all places. And they run the same analysis on the Finnish market. But they decided to try to see whether you know, European legislation would also make a difference. Now, apart from the numbers, these are thousands of these meetings, same methodology, same thing, same probability distribution, etc. Do you see any difference between the two maps? There's no comparison. One is God knows, yes, no, or whatever. The other one is like, yes and no. Perfectly polarized, piece of cake. That is how you not model the world. Because yes, it's doable, but you've done exactly what I told you, you know, uh, Donald Duck. Remember when Donald Duck has to you know, make the light to that? Make the things, put everything in, close the light and then with a tail, scissors, cuts everything that is sticking out. So it's all fit in the light It does fit in the light Shame about the clothes. So this is what we started. This paper was picked up by the economist, and ever since has been quoted no end. Again, again, and again. Now, imagine that law, taxation, universal basic income, inequality are excluded as something that makes a difference to the job market. You can predict anything this way. Uh, now, imagine that I decided the wings, the uh, Seas, the uh, temperature make no difference to predicting the weather tomorrow. I'll tell you exactly what it is. Oh, yes, it has nothing to do with the world. There are some, well, there's some value in this, and I'll tell you more about it, but that's why we need a bit of extra time. I think uh, I'll, um, I'll try to finish this uh, and then see whether we have a bit of extra time or otherwise question tomorrow. So this is the distribution of uh, the uh, labor force in America. Again, we have the United States, we have the data there. Uh, it's not that we privilege the United States, it's just that we have a lot of data and good data about uh, the a very unified, huge market. We could have the data about Europe, but it's all fragmented, Germany, France, with some legislation as well, etc. So the, um, the line that goes from 70% in 1840 all the way down to collapsing in 2010 is the number of people in agriculture. The United States could actually close the agricultural business. The, the, the country could almost not notice. Now, the objection to that like, is, oh, but uh -huh. this is the number of people employed, not contribution to GDP, the same. The contribution to the GDP of the agricultural sector is almost negligible. In the same way as agriculture 
contribution to the job market in the United States is almost negligible. See where zero is? We're talking about two, three percent. Virtually nobody works. I mean, you, you have to drive miles and miles to find any one guy, one person say, oh yes, and I you know, dominate the infinite actors of any you know, tool or computerized, etc. Et the black line here is people working in industry. So this one are also called brown colors. Brown colors have been going down and down and down in terms of numbers since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Donation, 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 donation. The black line is the uh, so-called um, uh, blue colors working in the street. For example, car factories, classic, heavy uh, employers at some time. Industry uh, started started growing. Uh, this is the sort of uh, post-war uh, revolution, so to speak, and then it started decreasing. These days, it's actually below 20%. In fact, together with agriculture, they don't make together 20% of the whole working force. Uh, I'll show you, uh, I think I have another uh, slide uh, which is more precise than this. The only thing that has been growing is services of any kind. The white skull, white colors, probably everybody in this room. Uh, and everybody was listening to this lecture, or will be listening to this lecture, uh, most likely. Um, there's about 80% chances that <laughs> you belong. Now, uh, that's kind of a joke. <clears throat> These white collars are the ones challenged by AI. Because now that you can, for example, process automatic text, fill forms, produce, uh, say, uh, graphic designs, um, make little videos, and all that is kind of doable also by AI. So the challenge that in the past was for the brown colors and then the uh, blue colors is now catching up with the white colors. This is as bad as it gets in terms of science. It's a picture that I found from the, uh, I get from the MIT, MIT Technology Review, uh, beautiful. And it tells you how the speculation became just a cottage industry in terms of how many jobs AI is going to be, is going to destroy Look at the data. These are in the 10 or million of jobs. Now, in a country that has a couple of hundred, yeah, not even 250. How, how many people live in the States these days? So, this would be 10% of the population without a job. Now, the population, of course, includes old people, retired people, children, and people who don't like to work, et cetera. According to the Bank of England, by the time it's 2036, or between 2034 or 36, 30 million jobs will be destroyed by information. Now, this is the definition of crystal ball, literally. Are the people, Forrester here, science alert, Forrester changed his mind. Well, initially it was 2018, they said, yeah, about 15, now, nah, 10. Oh no, make it 25. Well, of course, all this comes with, with never a margin of error, which is the only scientific way of doing it. If you have seen one paper in science, one, where there's an empirical uh, analysis, it tells you what is the probability that you might be wrong, no, so to speak. It gets better. These are, um, again, Fry and Osborne, the famous paper. This is PwC, one of the consultants company, this is the OECD, replaced by robots and algorithms, 2030 in the US and UK. So the three colors, United States, one says 47, the other one says 38, the other one says nine. Now that's not a margin of error. This is throwing numbers randomly. UK, 35, 30, 10. Who's right, who's wrong? The problem is twofold, and this is uh, I'm afraid it sounds like arrogant, but it's really economics 101. First, work is not a pie. It never was, it never will be. It's not a finite amount such that if you take a slice and give it to a robot, there's left less for humans. The idea that it's a pie is a bit simplistic, 
cellularly. And it's easy to understand that if you have any done any work at all in the house. I know I've had a lot of you know, chores. You can see where you know, the pain lies, but suddenly you need to clean the house. Is there a finite amount? No. You could go on and on. Maybe the carpets need uh, extra clean. Maybe uh, you know, the, that little piece of silverware. Maybe uh, you can do an extra dishwasher or washing machine. Maybe uh, the garden. There's an infinite amount of work. So what it really happens is that there is a threshold. In the house, the threshold is time, energy, uh, will to leave, like <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, I said, you know what? That's it. Uh, well, today, job done. But the, in economic context, the threshold is between the economically viable and economically not viable. Is it, does it make sense to do that job, economically speaking, or does it not? Now, the digital revolution, as all, all the other technological revolutions, they move that threshold. They make things that were not economically viable, they make it economically viable. So what was the production, for example, of shoes, which was economically viable only for you know, a few people in the world, and therefore handmade, etc., became automation, available, not the size, the, the, the size, the number, the quality, the color. I don't know, today, you know, shoes making is totally industrialized. So the, sorry, uh, the economic viability of that particular activity has changed completely. Now take the cheap airlines. Cheap airlines are possible mostly because of the IT revolution. The allocation of resources, uh, of places, you know what is more expensive is that expensive it takes to not hire or, or, or rent or have that particular space in that far away airport that you still advertise as if you were in Frankfurt, but in fact you're on the other side of the universe. How many times have we done that, et cetera? So, once you know that work is not a pie, so it doesn't work like once life goes less for everybody, and that threshold is movable, then you know that predictions are based on a fixed amount and a fixed threshold, therefore totally unreliable. Now, I'm not saying that the job market will not be and is not being completely transformed by the digital revolution, AI included, but I'm saying that all those predictions, fanciful. They're based on assumptions that are not delivering an actual understanding. This is a video that by now should speak volumes. So this was an attempt by, uh, I think, Walmart to introduce a computer, a computerized kind of AI um, uh, assistant to look at the shelves Notice what was missing and shut up the guy. Uh, I wouldn't know how to do that on a Mac. Um, um, let's freeze it here. So this object here scans the shelves, tells, it's able to spot what products are missing and either in a sort of perfect scenario, puts the products missing there, for example, toothpaste, or alerts people to go there and put them there. So what is the problem with this thing? They say, oh, that's, that's it. The people with this job, that's it, they're gone. It's been dismissed uh, after several years of attempts. The reason, first of all, it doesn't work that well. Second, you still have to have someone who goes, picks up the toothpaste, then puts it here. So you may as well have the same person checking that it's not there in the first place. Second, this space, you wish. This is, uh, as you can tell, a nice scenario. It's a place where these shelves are already not built for the robot. It's a robot built for the shelves. Bad idea. Don't we know better? Irony. It's not going to work, and in fact, it doesn't work very well. It has to scan all this. All these things have to be precisely put there. If something is turned, it doesn't scan it. Remember the warehouse where it does work? The warehouse is built for the robot. This is built for humans. 
And it's not built like this. If you go to Walmart or any other place, you can barely pass through because the space downtown is at a premium. You put as many uh, shelves as possible. And I don't know how many people here from the United States, certainly uh, Eddie, but you can tell that if there's someone, you really pass like this. So, sorry, excuse me. Uh, so this thing bumps into people. People don't like it. And so once you start having people rejecting, not going to the one of the robots scan, is it? That's, that's it. So did we actually talk about this when we were thinking a robot can do the scan? The person who does the uh, scanning, the job is destroyed. But that is just no intuition back on the envelope. This is the real world. So, Walmart's inventory robots, 2017, 2020. After 2020, in the dust lab. You don't see them anywhere. Project abandoned. It doesn't work. Goodbye. This is the BBC. This is beautiful. I find particularly juicy given the role that BBC has had on uh, to push uh, for Brexit. Uh, this is my little tiny revenge. Um, I stopped watching the BBC after no, uh, the campaign for Brexit. Uh, back to the topic. Um, BBC News, 25 March 2019. Highest and lowest probability of jobs at risk from automation. Look at this. Waiters, 73%. Okay, point number one. Not even 70, 73. No, 72, no, 73, three. You immediately have to reach for your statistical Kalashnikov and say, this is so suspicious already. How can it be so precise? In what world? But now, this is why. Sainsbury in 2019 launched this particular experiment. A store has been refurbished to be mobile first and checkout free. No people. So among the many people here, shelf fillers. Remember the shelf fillers, Walmart? No, mind, we are in 2019. They are still trying to make this thing work. Not really, so that, 72% after 20. But elementary said, all these things, generated by experiment like Sainsbury, another big supermarket in, uh, in the UK. This is 29 April 2019. Sainsbury launches UK first teal free grocery store. 10 September 2019, Sainsbury reinstalls steel in teal free store. Thank you, BBC. Disaster. Why? You didn't go there. For the Italians in the room, um, back to the Panther station, there is the do it yourself. And the queue with the person who helps you. Where do you go? The queue with the person, if you have time. Uh, it's much easier. Just buy them. It's not, I'm just going to pay the guy, not the guy who go there, not the health manager. It's not short attitude. Did we consider, with all those tens of millions of people being out of job, the social pressure, for example, of going to a shop where they actually help you to put things and calculate, et cetera? And one way you have to have the mobile, the credit card, the but this is my uh, little uh, vendetta with the BBC. Waiters, 73% probability that we'll lose the job. 2019. This is actually data from um, Statista, uh, 2014, 15, 16, 26. This is the number of waiters and waitresses in the United States employed. Goes up and up and up and up. Why? Because you want to go to a place where someone possibly nice and calm gives you a cup of tea. It, that's the real world. So how come that in no, the last decade or so, we've been claiming that AI will destroy, eliminate. In fact, to the point like, what are we going, we've got genocide. What are we going to do with that humanity, which is out of job? There's not enough. Meanwhile, as we speak, the American economy is overheating with two jobs for every single person looking for a job. We don't know how to stop that, meaning high inflation, the Fed you know, puts uh, up the uh, rate uh, at which you can borrow money, et cetera, et cetera. This is the real world, and I will keep this slides for a long time. It's old. Um, it's November 2018, and it's Lawrence. 
The point, the bottom is uh, telling you the whole story. Lloyd Banking Group has confirmed that it's cutting 6,240 jobs and creating, at the same time, 8,240. That's very precise. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Six to 40 go, eight to 40 come in. That's the world in which you want to live, unless you are one of the six to 20 to 40 going home. Because the one rehired are not the same sent home. And there's the problem. The problem is the difference between those who lose the job and then cannot find another job because the job, it doesn't exist and might be transformed as being, and all the demand for the market for new jobs for which we don't have skilled people, for which we don't have the right sort of personnel. So whereas, say, maybe the job for a waitress can attract no, people even no, with not so many skills, if you look for someone no, who's a data scientist, well, it doesn't matter if the person in question no, used to be, but no longer, and therefore is looking for a job. Look for a data scientist. And there's only so few data scientists around, not enough. So the difference is not, oh, how wonderful this life is, because this 6,240, very few will have been, I don't know how, we don't know how many, will be rehired, probably for different jobs at different salaries, but above all, all the new ones will not be the same ones to send home. That is a problem where uh, we have a lot of difficulties. This is again from uh, uh, the BBC, um, cumulative jobs losses attributed to automation since 2000. As you can tell, uh, we are in uh, talking about very, very different numbers. We're talking about millions, not tens of millions. But it's a different case. I mean, worldwide. So, more uh, on this, uh, we're almost there. Gartner is another beautiful one. 2014, smart robots will take over a third of jobs by 2025. Gartner, AI will be net job creator by 2025. That's the way they do science. A third of the job this way. That's the blue line here. At least in this particular market. Uh, in 2020, AI becomes a total net job motivator, creating 2.3 million jobs while only eliminating 1.8 million jobs. It goes on and on and on about this. So the point that I'm making here is that jobs, a lot of the jobs, are a little bit like interfaces between two things. It could be between me and an elevator between uh, me and a car and a GPS on one hand and a car on the other. It could be me between the pump and the car. Now, this, this jobs, uh, this is gone because the regulation changed. I'm not simplifying, but if you need to have a little driving license to operate an engine, then this gentleman here has the uh, authorization, the technical skills, the training to operate the elevator. You abolish that particular constraint uh, legally, this gentleman, the job is gone because you can just push it yourself, DIY. The only place I've ever been was Japan, where in some companies you still have someone with white gloves that actually push the buttons and you ask about, like, the 27th floor, thank you, sir. And he pushes 27, and he lets you in. It uh, happened twice in my whole life. But otherwise, the job is gone. The job was this lady here could go if you create the environment for this car to be with our driver. Remember the bus at the airport, you build the whole airport around the driver's car, but then it happens. This, on an everyday basis, now that we know increasingly how much Tesla has been uh, sort of gently producing information that was utterly unreliable in terms of how really autonomous those cars were, would all the accidents happen, et cetera, et cetera. This job at the moment, me translating your instruction from GPS into manoeuvring, pretty safe. We're talking about level five. Uh, this gentleman here, uh, his job is safe because we made a mistake. We designed cars such that they need a human interface to be refilled. That was a long, long time ago. We didn't think ahead. But for the driver's cars, but above all for the electric cars, there should not be a design that we make that mistake for. And yet we are making exactly that mistake. Every driver's car we're building is such that we have, it needs a human being to be in charge as an interface. 
take it and stick it in, put it back. That is the most absurd use of human intelligence on the universe. When you know you could get an automatic system that something from the bottom, from the top. In fact, there was a video that doesn't exist anymore, uh, and I failed to save it, unfortunately. But if you find it, anyone online, please share it. Tesla, at some point, had an automatic kind of robot that would charge a Tesla. It was horrible. I know why they remove it. If you ever seen it, it was this kind of snake that was coming from the wall, and by gyrating and moving around, literally, like, like, at some point, they identified the hole and ta, got the hook. You see, it looked like a horror sci-fi movie. I can see why they remove it. It probably was unsafe. If you find it online, please share it with me because uh, it's a piece. You did? Excellent. It, it's, it's there. It, it's, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. And we found it. We will share it with you uh, tomorrow. Uh, and uh, it's really impressive. But not something you want to see in your garage, isn't it? A bit disturbing. Yeah. So, so it can be done. So we can design cars, electric cars, such that they get recharged automatically. Make it something very nice, like a little thing that pops up from the bottom, charges and disappears, whatever. No, we will have uh, human beings, although more than one billion cars in the world. Imagine the time it takes to recharge them by humans. Beautiful. Uh, this uh, lady has also disappeared uh, quite uh, radically in the United States. Sorry, uh, yeah, well, in the United States, uh, certainly in the UK, because I'm the one who actually scans the beans. Uh, she's no longer there. But new interfaces will pop up, new jobs where you need to put A and B together. So the question is not everything is fine and great. Uh, no, no jobs destroyed. No, this is a revolution. These are being completely transformed upside down, bottom up. To think all in terms of tens of millions of jobs destroyed, humanity will have to retire. We need to find a way of giving a, a, a pre pensioning everybody because there won't be any work in the future. That is science fiction and a bad car. It means not having a sense of how society works, how things actually develop. So, AI and the replacement, sorry, displacement, new placement of human interfaces. As I said, these this people, sorry, uh, the way forward. Uh, is to have a job here, is to learn the languages spoken by the digital revolution. It means not just, of course, obviously, a programming or whatever Python uh, will be tomorrow, but the languages spoken by information include, for example, music. If you cannot read music, for example, I, I provide normally to make sure that people understand the whole range, the whole range of uh, languages, if you don't speak music, if you cannot write some music, if you cannot read it, well, that world is outside of anything that you will ever have as a chance to get a job in the music sector. That might include, for example, soundtracks for computer games, just to know, or, or a sound uh, technician. But that includes, of course, uh, ancient dead languages, as we study them uh, here in Italy, Latin and Greek, uh, seems to be something that, unless you have studied Greek, who, what, what kind of individual you are. Um, but all the way down to physics, chemistry, biology, history, architecture, uh, literature, the languages spoken by information. In other words, reading and writing is still essential. It's just what kind of reading and what kind of writing. The writing, I stress, transform a user into a producer. If you have only a passive understanding, it means like being able to read an entry in Wikipedia, for example, and not being able to correct it. That is not being yet 100% a participant in an information society. So the test is, how many languages can I speak, quote unquote? As many, as many entries in Wikipedia you can correct. You can spot a mistake and say, aha, no, this can get wrong then. No, this is a mistake, it's not right. Oh, this, this function, no, this equation in physics, no, no. This translation in German, it's not quite right. Oh, this uh, piece of analysis in you know, literature, oh, this is rubbish. Or oh, look at this, you know, when you still, this thing, for that thing in the architectural design, on and on and on and on. These are all languages that you can speak. The more you can speak, the better it is, your chances of actually having a position there. But it's not the end of the work, so as such. It's the end of some skills, yeah, 
the end of some business models, absolutely. The end of work as a job, um, that I welcome. We can all work a lot without having a job. In fact, actually, the whole uh, feminist revolution, part of that was to recognize that the immense, gigantic, enormous work done by any housewife or millennia was a job and therefore was immensely contributing to the welfare of family, society, blah, 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 blah. But with the idea that work is a job, and a job is a, no, a paycheck at the end of the month, then uh, no, I don't know how many millions of people never had a job and never contributed anything. That is insane. And also, perhaps, the, the end of a modernity identification of me and my job. If you find someone that says, who are you, and they give you the job title, they're your mother. So now, who is Peter? A lawyer. Well, surely it's many other things than just a lawyer. Uh, a football player, no, for fun, maybe you know, uh, my schoolmate or a husband or whatever. I mean, uh, a jerk, but more than just you know, the job. This comes with, I am my business card. The business card that you give tells other people who you are. The job is the people, the person, the person is the job. That is a very modern way of identifying who we are. It comes from the developed society, the, you know, the organization of work, etc. But hopefully, as we move into another society, uh, the idea that we are our jobs will be at least uh, taken you know, for granted. Uh, surely, in a society in which dad was a doctor, a GP, granddad was a doctor, GP, grand granddad was a job and a GP, you start being a philosopher, that puts things in a different perspective. So, almost there. Uh, I think we have a minute or two. Um, Back to uh, ChatGPT and uh, the risk and the uh, opportunities for tomorrow morning. So announcing what we're going to cover. Um, we have seen uh, yeah, uh, the little side.